So good morning. Um, so my talk this morning is called Hell is Frozen Over, DevOps and Security. Uh, am I going to cooperate? All right, we're just going to swap. So who am I? Uh, I'm James Turnbull. I work at Puppet Labs. I was one of the early employees of Puppet Labs. Before that, I was the release manager for the Puppet project. Uh, I wrote a lot of the documentation, which has now thankfully been written by people who speak proper English. Um, before that, I was uh, reported to the chief security officer uh, at a large Australian bank, and I was, ran a CERT team, for those of you familiar with CERT, computer emergency response team. It's largely about e-fraud, um, security incident management, um, and I've been a security architect and an operations person for about 20 years. I've written six technical books, including two about Puppet. Uh, I've just released a book called The Logstash Book about Logstash, which is an open source logging tool. Um, even if you don't buy the book, you should look at Logstash. It's really awesome. Um, if you use something like Splunk or Logly, um, it's a very cheap alternative, um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty cool project. Uh, I always say this, and Josh Timberman te teased me earlier, I am Australian, I do talk with a funny accent, and I have a habit of talking very quickly. Uh, if you don't understand something I say, don't be ashamed to put your hand up and go, huh? Um, I, I, I don't take offence, there's, there's about six other Australians in the audience, and they, they may be the only ones who understand me through the whole talk, we'll see how we go. This one, I, I have to, the bottom one here, I also, being Australian, have the occasional habit of dropping words that are inappropriate into my presentations. It's cultural. Uh, I'm really sorry about it. I try really hard not to, but occasionally bad words come out and I apologise in advance. I'm doing, working really hard to try and prevent that in the future. <laughs> okay, so does anyone here work in operations? All right, maybe, maybe a, a, not a huge crew. How about developers? Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure from Gene's talk that, that, uh, that me and Gene are the only security people in the room, is that right? Uh, Josh, Josh is going to claim to be a security person. I guess he was in the past, we'll claim it now. Um, so I spent about, about 10 years working in IT security in, in little organisations and big organisations, and my last job was in a massive enterprise organisation. We had about 50,000 staff and about 6,000 IT staff, and IT security is about 300 people. And uh, I left that job to go and work in a startup. And one of the reasons I, some of the reasons I left that job is I didn't really like it. It wasn't a lot of fun. Um, and there's a, there's a number of reasons why it wasn't a lot of fun. Here's the things I hated about security. People don't like you. I actually would have project managers who would hide. Like, I would go and visit a project team, and the project manager would go and get coffee because he was heard I was walking across the, the campus towards his building. <laughs> because you're not usually the bearer of good news. Usually the guy who goes, yeah, we just tested that code and wow, you guys should really salt those passwords because, yeah, we cracked all of them. Um, and, and that's the last thing a project wants, manager wants to hear a week before the project goes live. Um, my, I wasn't very effective at my job because um, I, I, was, I was sort of, security is sort of an afterthought in a lot of organisations. It's something that comes along at the end and, and sort of, no, we'll, we'll, well, we'll code review this code or we'll penetration test this application. By the time you get that, all of that done, it's like the day before the application is going to go live, and no one is going to, is going to say, we're going to stop, we're not going to pull the trigger. So it was hard to, to actually do, you know, be good at my job. Um, and all of that resulted in me not being particularly happy. Um, and uh, so when I first started, um, when I first started uh, thinking about this particular topic, I, I stole a meme, and you'll see a lot of memes today, but I stole this meme. I like this meme a lot. Um, it's the, you know, the, the what people think people think, think you do. So, this is what generally what the rest of IT think, think that security do. You know, there's these guys with the plastic cuffs and the batons, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I'm sure most developers think they're somewhere on the Occupy Wall, Wall, Occupy Wall Street uh, spectrum, but this is security come to hit your head on the head. And, and I, I, a number of developers who tell me that they have little time or respect for security comes from this, this phenomenon of what they think security people are like. The business is even worse. The business thinks that we're these totalitarian guys who come in and say, no, you can't do your job. You can't sell that product. Um, and, and the business generally se se sees that um, you know, security is a, is a no entity. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's a group that, that, that generally spends most of their time blocking the, the, the actual part of the, these big people's jobs that, that are really important to them, the actual selling a product or talking to a customer. Sadly, this is what security people think they do. Um, <laughs> so. And, and to be honest, there's some very, very smart people in security. So, uh, you know, to some extent, this is true. You, you come across some incredibly intelligent people. Um, and, and they're capable of looking at really complex problems in unusual ways and coming up with awesomely good solutions. But since there's a considerable mismatch between these groups, um, 
Now, it's important to understand what security isn't. So this is something that's happened very slowly in the security community. Uh, in about, it started about, about eight, nine years ago. Uh, there's a few people, um, some people may be familiar with um, COSAC and organizations like that, where they basically sat down and said, you know, why do we always come to these conf security conferences, sit around the bar, drink hard liquor and talk to each other about why our lives are miserable and why we hate the teams we work with and why the business thinks we suck. Um, and we, we, you know, a bunch of us started to say, well, how about if the first answer out of our mouths wasn't no anymore, it was something else? So what will we do in, in return? What will we do differently that will make security a bit more interesting? So how about we do it about partnership? How about we actually look at it in terms of we all work for the same company. Me saying no to the IT organization or no to the business about something is not actually a productive activity. The productive way to deal with this particular problem is me to say, OK, this is my perspective. This is my, my, my view on how the world works. And here's why I think we have a problem. How do we work together to solve the problem? Um, and a significant part of that equation is that you have to accept the fact that sometimes you're not going to win that argument. And security people don't like that, but they get there slowly. Um, as I said, understanding and, and, and identifying that all, that all of the customers in the organization, both the external and internal customers, um, are, are our customers too, our security people's customers. And that a security person's primary job is about increasing the business's risk appetite. So the business gets risk. They understand um, you, 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 it's very unusual to come across a business person who doesn't understand things like credit and market risk, who doesn't understand what the financials of their business are. Um, it's very rare to find those people in IT, and it's even rarer to find them in security. So you need to start, security people need to start to understand that their job is actually to allow the business to take you know, better risk decisions, more, more aggressive risk decisions. And essentially your job is in an enablement role. It's, it's how, do, how, how do you help the business uh, do business. So it talks a lot about, about security. So where, where, does this, where does this sort of intersect with DevOps? So the group of people um, that sat down and started talking about this concept of security not saying no, when DevOps came along, I started sending all of these articles and like, to, to, to a bunch of these guys. And I'm like, my god, somebody else in IT gets this stuff. Somebody else in IT understands that you know, this is a collaborative, cooperative venture. It's not, it's not an exercise in, in us being, being hard asses and saying no to people. And we sat down and went, you know, uh, how would we adopt some of these ideas and how would we make some of these ideas work for security? Um, and there's a couple of reasons we chose to do that. One was that DevOps was a really powerful meme at the time, uh, and still is to some extent, um, and, and that's useful for, for picking things up. Pe people are, are less likely to be resistant to things that I think other popular people are doing it too. Um, and, and DevOps is, is, is currently in that sort of, you know, cusp of adoption sort of phase that, that, that sort of allows it to sneak in the door and... and, and, and it's full of people like me with tattoos and hippie, hipster black glasses, and you know, you're like, ooh, you know, guys at Flickr and John Allspore and Etsy and those really cool people. They sell like crocheted things. They must be cool. Um, so that was one aspect. The other aspect of it was that it's actually a really good idea. Um, in terms of security people want to be part of, of the IT collective. They want to be part of the group that, that sort of drives the business. They want to be successful, just like all of the, re the rest of the IT organization does. So, there's a really important aspect of this that, that it covers more than just security, but it covers you know, why, why, why should you involve your security people in your DevOps program. Um, it's because security people are people too. And apparently in the United States, the corporations are people too, but you know, who knew? Um, so the, you know, the issue for me is that, that a lot of IT people perceive security people as being a different sort of, a different bunch of, a, a rich group of people, people that don't actually share uh, much DNA with the rest of the IT organization. They're, they're weird specialists. They don't really know uh, m much about what the actual IT organization does, and sometimes they, they know even less about what the business does. This is actually not true. So if I looked at the team I built in my last role, security team, um, I had a bunch of people who, who would not be m much different from developers. They were uh, code reviewers, um, penetration testers, uh, guys who had you know, spent a lot of time deep in things like Assembler and C, uh, right up to people who could, you know, scan through, a, scan through a, a few meter lines of Java, or worse, a few meter lines of COBOL, and tell you where the security pro problems are. The security people who manage your firewalls, who look after your encryption, they're just operations people. They do exactly the same job. They use the same tools. Um, they have the same methodologies. You know, you show a, a security person a, a, an ops checklist, and you show an ops person a security checklist. They're essentially the same document, a little slightly different bent. There's people who do DBA stuff. Um, anyone who does um, horrible things like uh, 
uh, I don't know, um, PeopleSoft Security or you know something like that. Those guys are those guys are essentially uh, you know roughly a DBA sort of person. A, a lot of security people who do network stuff, they're no different from a network engineer. And same with storage people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it made a lot of sense to me that that you know we are a very similar community security people. We fit into this world. We should actually be part of this community. The other aspect in here is that. Um, if you're doing DevOps stuff, you are about to make a, a fairly radical change in the way your business works and the way you operate things. Um, and the temptation in that, that thing is to say that, well, you know, where does, you know, do we still care about security? Now, if we deploy 10 times a day, we're not going to have time to stop for security stuff. Um, and that's the wrong approach to take. The type approach to take here is that um, security should be an important aspect of all of this sort of stuff. If, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you want to put your foot on the accelerator, you want to make sure that all the groups in the organization are, are happy with that decision, and B, you want to make sure you're making good risk decisions. And security people are actually really good at working out what a good risk decision is, um, and sometimes not so great at communicating them, but that's a skill that they can learn. Um, but they're really good at working out, you know, how, we, we can do this, and this is the things we should think about. These are the controls we should think about putting into place. And a big part of that is that um, e that evolution for, for security people is, 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 a, is a mutual path. So, um, you know, you, you, you are going to find that, that you know, there will be resistance inside your organization to DevOps concepts. Uh, you know, the classic scenarios I've decided things like increased deployment. And uh, Gene mentioned in his talk that, uh, you know, that, that people's immediate, immediate reaction when you say, let's do things faster is, oh my god, no, let's do things slower. Um, because, you know, you obviously get heaps better at, at jumping out of airplanes and, you know, with a parachute if you only do it once a year. Um, whereas, you know, if you are going to do that thing, that accelerate that thing, you need to be really good at it. So all the people involved, all the people in the, in, the li in the life cycle need to be able to understand this as well. And the, the classic example I give is that, you know, you, you're, you're in an organization, you've introduced some DevOps stuff, uh, you know, your, your biggest problem in the past was that getting servers to a project team took six or eight weeks because, you know, there was the procurement guys needed to sign a form and then the project manager needed to raise the right form and then somebody else needed to order the machine and need to get shipped in and need to get built and it passed from about six different teams to get built and finally gets handed over to the project and the project goes, yeah, we want to connect it to the network, and then the network team has to raise a request to get a port open, and then the firewall team needs it. So you notice a part of that exchange, there's a whole bunch of different people handling stuff in that. So if you fix a couple of those problems, if you make your procurement faster, or if you make your operations faster, or if development and QA you know, decrease their test cycle, but it still takes you four weeks to get a firewall open, you don't solve any of your problems. Um, so it's something that needs to be done in conjunction. So, a lot of the time um, uh, when I was thinking about this, I was like, you know, so how do you get security people? What buttons can you push to get security people to care about this DevOps stuff? Um, and a large part of it, as with all DevOps, isn't about tools, isn't about really about um, methodology that much. It's really about people. Um, and I talked earlier about the fact that security people are people too. Um, they're people in your organization. It's changing some of those cultural barriers. And they're particularly bad between IT and security. Um, I, you know, the, the DevOps movement is famous for saying that, that you know, the classic scenario of the developer writing an application and uh, you know, getting to Friday afternoon, throwing it over the fence, saying, it's deployed, here's the war file, I'm rushing off to the pub and getting drunk, and the operations team going, oh my god, we've got to deploy this. And, uh, and they, you know, they, they, they install the application, discover it doesn't work because they're using a version, they've developed a version of the JVM that we don't have in production. Or, it's not designed to be secure, or it doesn't fit with the backup, or the IP addresses are hard-coded, you know, a number of dozen reasons. So that's a classic sort of, you know, why De is DevOps a good idea scenario. Um, and in that, in the same way, um, you know, that, 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 the res end result of that, you know, is obviously the post-mortem on Monday, or, or worse, three o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, uh, where, where somebody says, I hate you guys, you guys have crap code, and the operations, you know, uh, the developer people going, it worked on my machine, and you guys are obviously stupid. Um, and, and therefore, you know, that, that, that I've been in that war room a number of times, and that conversation deteriorates really rapidly uh, to, to all sorts of name-calling and occasional violence. Um, but what's even worse is, is I've been in those war rooms where it's a security problem, and security people are very defensive. Like, like your job is to be, like, sort of a little bit, a little bit defensive about things, but they can be, tend to be a little bit, you know, rough around the edges when it comes to, to dealing with other people and dealing with these particular problems. They can, you know, those scenarios equ and equally end in things like, uh, we went live with the application, and we discovered uh, on the day before, you know, the day before we went live, we discovered a, let's say, a severity one vulnerability um, in some of the in, in some subsystem or something we used to, to do it. But we launched anyway because, you know, 
And the security team goes, you didn't tell us? Oh my god, this is exposure, you know, we could lose a million dollars an hour. And this conversation very quickly degrades from there. So uh, the, the sort of cultural interactions that security and operations people have, that security and development have, are very similar to the cultural interactions that, that, that developers and operations have. So it's really important up front. Security people are used to being blamed for things, by the way. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with this, but we are a really easy target. Um, projects that are about to go live when you discover some vulnerabilities, the project manager is like, awesome, I get an extra four weeks on my Gantt chart because security's just told me a bunch of things is wrong, and I get to blame them for it. Um, it's never, by the way, the security bugs problem. It's always the security team for finding the bug. Um, uh, this is a fairly classic corporate scenario. Um, and project managers, I, you know, I must admit, project managers uh, you know, are, are sometimes guilty of this, and security people, you know, sometimes their behavior will also contribute to this. But the first thing you need to do is destroy that blame culture. Destroy the culture of, this is your fault, this is, um, this is you know, uh, John Osborne talks very heavily about the fact that you can't actually have a proper conversation about a problem if your primary interest is covering your ass or finding someone else to blame for the problem. If your primary interest in the conversation is solving the problem, all of a sudden a whole bunch of stuff goes away um, and a whole bunch of interactions become really smooth. And I strongly recommend you read John Osborne's um, posts on his blog about running blame-free post-mortems. Um, because when I read those, I was like, Haha, I remember some of these conversations where I'm sitting down with the network vendor, I'm sitting down with the security team, and you can see the first thing in their mind is, I hope, I hope we didn't do anything that caused this problem. How do we make it somebody else's problem? Ah, the network team upgraded some firmware. Definitely can't be our problem. If that's the first thing you're thinking about, you are not going to achieve very good results. So you need to get rid of that culture. The second thing is, um, whoops. Sorry, I'm gonna, my slide does, has decided it doesn't want to change. So the second thing is you need to start to speak some of the same language. And I, I think I've mentioned in the talk a couple of times the word risk. Um, the word risk is a really interesting term in, in the corporate world. Uh, it means a whole bunch of different things. Security people mean it, um, it you generally take it to mean, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a definition. This definition is horrible. It's one of the, this, I, this is not for, this is more for edification rather than, uh, this is from the, um, the CISA standards. Risk management is the process of identifying vulnerabilities and threats to the information resources used by an organization. Oh my god. Are you asleep? I am. Um, so security people use this all the time to, to sort of, and they come up with elaborate systems to, to determine how, you know, how big a vulnerability something is or how high risk something is. And you end up with a risk register full of things that don't mean very much. But there's some really useful things about risk that, that's actually easy to adopt and easy to change. And learning how to speak some of that risk language is a really good way of communicating with security people. Um, first and foremost, risk is, is essentially is, risk is about letting the business do business with the right controls. And the right controls are things like, uh, you know, uh, we, have a particular, we have a particular exposure or vulnerability. We stand to lose, you know, let's say that we stand, we stand to have our, our, our public web-facing presence down and we're a public listed company, we could lose a lot of money and PR and credibility. Um, so we should assess that in terms of, of actual, the actual external facing real world consequences of that. Instead of like, you know, this is a technology risk because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a step, you know, a step up authentication problem that, that's, you know, this particular vulnerability. Stop talking in terms of those technological problems, start talking in terms of terms that the business will understand. If you start to introduce some of that conversation into the business, and, and both from operations from the development perspective and from the security perspective, is you're like, okay, I want to talk to you a bit about the risks involved in us doing this particular thing. Now, how do we quantify those? And then start to quantify those risks in terms, of, in terms of business terms, in terms of this is actual dollars we may lose. This is actual you know, the potential public exposure of a particular problem. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of really um, useful outcomes from that is because security models are built on this whole risk concept. If you can plug into that, that concept, you can identify the things that DevOps are good at that will make, risk, make doing business in, in, in a, with the right controls easier. And here's a... Here's a really good example of, of, of talking controls and why, and why security people care about this stuff. So provisioning and deployment. Um, I talked earlier about the fact that you know, if you've got a life cycle that involves engaging security people to say burn firewall rules or change network ports or uh, you know, add, add, add an encryption interface or whatever it happens to be, if you can demonstrate to them that, that the particular process you're adopting makes it a hell of a lot more efficient for them to do that, that their life gets easier um, and there's concepts like self-service here, but also a concept like, you know, you should stick all of this configuration in a version control system. You should use a configuration management tool. Anything that will make their lives easier. The actual guy, operations guys on the ground, 
they're interested in the same things you are as operations people and the same thing that developers are interested in, which is solve the problem as fast as possible so I can go to the pub. Um, and the second one there, configuration management. Configuration drift and inconsistency. Uh, it, to be, I've, I've, I've dealt with a lot of different sort of threats as a, as a security person. My biggest fear is not some guy in Bulgaria with a PhD in mathematics who wants to try and penetrate um, you know, uh, our internet banking system. Not particularly worried about that guy. There's a, there's a handful of them. Some of them are really smart. I probably don't have a defense against a lot of those guys. My biggest fear is uh, inconsistency and configuration drift because that happens naturally. It happens through entropy. Uh, it's very hard to control, and it happens in a large-scale kind of way. If I can introduce some new controls, like Puppet or Chef or something like that, in, that as a way of actually controlling that configuration drift, of actually preventing that inconsistency, then I'm going to significantly reduce the impact um, of a particular problem in my environment. I'm going to significantly, over the whole environment, reduce my ex risk exposure. Um, I reckon if you, those of you who operate, does any of you operate in a business that has a risk register? Like you have a, you know, a team that, that constructs a list of risks. There's, a, there's, a, there's some ISP guys that... that um, but a lot of organizations have... Or do you have a list of security problems or a security registry if you have a security team that does that? That has a long list of things in there and a lot of them will say things like, this system is not patched to this version. Or this, chain, this, this configuration is changed this way across 10% of our systems. Configuration management is a really fast way of, of, of knocking out a whole bunch of low-hanging fruit from that thing. And security people will love you if you provide them with a way to get rid of some really annoying things. Um, thirdly, you all probably work in organizations that have lots of machines. Um, if I challenged you to tell, you, tell me the sort of useful information about a whole bunch of those machines, those of you, some of you might have a CMDB maybe. Anyone have a CMDB? Oh, wow. There's only one person. He works at OpsCode. Uh, that's a shame. Um, CMDBs are awesome when they work. CMDBs all tend to be really bad because they tend to be two or three weeks out of date. Um, so what happens is when you have an incident, you go, I would like to look up the, the, the particular configuration of this particular instance of the JVM. I've got that in one of my configuration management databases. OK, last time was updated three weeks ago. And in the meantime, six people have made a change. And as a result, you try, you try to draw a remediation that doesn't work. In incident management, information is king. So knowing stuff about the environment. Um, I've been in situations where uh, I, was, I was called into a war room because I'm the only person who had a network diagram for some critical part of the infrastructure. Uh, if you have tools like configuration management, audit tools, if you are looking at, at sort of automation, then you have a whole stock of information that's really useful to the security people. Um, this is linked to the last item, which is audit, magic way auditors. Um, and I think the, the, the really interesting part of this is that a significant number of the times security come and bother you is about things like patching. Patching's really annoying because security people will come to you and they say, we've identified a vulnerability in the JVM. Tell me how many systems are vulnerable. And you go, bugger. All right, well, there goes my weekend. Run script, run more script. Oh, that's in the DMZ. Oh, tunnel through this, pack, bounce through that, you know, uh, gather this data. Ah, you know, oh, it's, it's come out in two different formats. Oh, no, I've got to work out whether this version on, on Solaris is a different version from this Ubuntu. And you compile a report, you stick it in an Excel spreadsheet, and you give it to the security guy you know, a week later or something like that. And a week or so goes by, and the security guy goes, yep, all right, it, it's vulnerable to 70% of the fleet. We're going to patch it. Please go and patch it now. And then you spend the next six months in change windows where every sort of little scrap you, of gap in your change cycle, you're trying to patch a different system with obviously the, the resulting sort of consequences and, 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 and confusion. Um, we have a, a, a customer of ours is, is, is Google. You may have heard of them. They have a search engine and they sell ads and stuff. Um, they manage about 30,000 desktops with Puppet. And one of their big problems was audit. I, I, you guys know security's had, Google's had some reasonably high profile security incidents where some bad people who live on the other side of the world tried to do bad things. Um, and there, so as a result, their auditors come through fairly regularly and look at all the systems and go, you know, you need to upgrade this version of OS X from here or this version of Java from here to here. Um, and that was a six to eight week exercise. The auditors would come in, uh, they'd review a whole bunch of stuff, they'd identify all the systems that had a problem, they'd compile a huge report, they'd break the report into a list of priorities, and they'd send them back to the operations guys and go, upgrade. And, and operations guys would go, okay, let's, you know, piece by piece, we'll go through an upgrade. And six to eight weeks to upgrade a, for a, a SEV1, save Java vulnerability, that's a, that's a pretty big window. There's also lots of opportunities in there. They decided to install Puppet. Uh, Nigel Kirsten, who's now our CTO, installed Puppet, and he was like, I can now generate a report on the fly in real time that I can send to the auditors and I, you know, I pipe it straight into an Excel spreadsheet and dump it into an email and it goes straight to them. 
they can look at that report, they send it back and tell me what to upgrade, and then I go through my systems and I go, ooh, change Puppet Manifest, hit enter, upgrade all of, the, all of those systems. This is an extremely annoying problem for you, and it's also an extremely annoying problem for security people. They would like this to go away. If some of your DevOps practices, if some of your tooling allows them, them to, this problem to go away for them, and they, have to, they can stop nagging you, um, they have to deal with auditors too. If those auditors never talk to them again, they'll be happy people as well. So um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to try and um, speak even more fast than I was. No, I'm kidding. Um, so ideas for collaboration. So this is going to be, you know, how do you, how do you actually get some of these conversations to happen? Um, I think probably really interestingly um, is get roles and responsibilities right. Um, so in most of your environments, you have a bunch of people who are, uh, you know, the question earlier was like, you know, how, how, what does a dev, dev, DevOps team look like? Um, I think one of the really big struggles between developers and operations people is, is who does what? And, and as a result, you know, and often that's quite linked to the, the consequences of doing what, so the blame piece of it. But the who does what, you know, so-and-so packages something, so-and-so passes over the fence, security does this. Instead of, instead of um, uh, you know, instead of doing it this way, um, actually sit down and go, if we're going to build a new life cycle, a new DevOps life cycle, then how do the rest of the teams fit in? How does storage fit in? How does networking fit in? How does security fit in? Make sure you understand that if you're going to change a bunch of the things about the way that you operate your business and the way you operate your IT organization, is that you involve everybody. Um, and that way, you actually you, know, you can take advantage of sort of new methodologies. Your security people are, are probably pretty smart people, um, and they've got good skills, and they're useful. Um, they know things, uh, practical things, about things like development, uh, about encryption. Um, they know things, lots of things, useful things about network and operating systems. Uh, involve them in the process. Um, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of useful tooling that comes out of DevOps. If you can, uh, if you can identify things in, in, in your security team's list of problems, low-hanging fruit, um, and point out to them, we, we might, be help, might be able to help you solve this problem. Uh, if you can sort of suck them in with, with, with a little bit of you know, uh, kindness, I guess, that's a really good way to sort of get started. Um, development and security. Put security people into development teams. I cannot emphasize enough, as much, as much how, how, how really important this is. Um, the worst case scenario for a security person is to discover there's a new project that's about to go live a week before it goes live and then scramble to try and find all the problems, uh, scramble to do a code, code review, scramble to do a pen test. If you put security people in at the very start of the process when you're actually developing requirements, when you're actually designing architecture, a whole bunch of these problems go away. And you're never going to get a perfect outcome, right? You're never going to get the scenario where the security guys... The security guys, let, let's face it, all of us would prefer if you stuck your laptop in a, in, a, in a concrete block, stuck it in a 44-gallon drum, and dropped it off a huge cliff. Um, because that's the safest system out there. Awesome. Um, but you're never gonna, we, ne we know we're not going to win that argument. But if up front, somebody asks me the question, what can we do to make this better? What's a good architecture we can try? I'm happy to negotiate with you. That's much better than me having a huge stand-up fight with you about the fact that, really, really, you should have done it this way. Or, my god, you've used that data encryption because I read this article and da, 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 da. All of those conversations are pointless and boring because um, no one wins. If you have that conversation up front, then you actually have an opportunity to say, OK, there may be, maybe there's still problems at the end, but they're quantifiable problems and we can work on those. They're not a, a massive unknown. Um, yeah, designed for security, deployed sanely and securely. Um, a significant number of problems that appear when you deploy applications in production Guess what? It turns out to be something like we didn't know this port needed to be open, or the firewall rule was never got burnt, or all of those sort of issues uh, are easy to solve if you identify that security is 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 something you, is you know is a base requirement of most applications and something you do up front. Ops teams um, embed security into es ops escalations. Uh, I, I when I first started in in a in a, in a security role in a bank, um, then security had a separate incident management process from operations. Sometimes it overlapped, but most of the time it's entirely separate. So I'd be getting escalated to a problem. I'd be getting an incident reported to me that operations was also working on. And I would often not know till like an hour into the process the fact that operations was pursuing what perceived to be an operational problem while I was pursuing a security problem. Uh, and it turns out, you know, if, I, if I'd been sitting in the same room or having the same conversation or being part of the same group, then all of a sudden this problem stops happening. Uh, additionally, a lot of the things you do during, during uh, an incident have security implications. Like, if you're an operations person or a developer, change you make on the fly can have some really big implications. Like, I, I'm sure none of us have ever done this, but it would be really simple um, since we can't work out how to trouble this, troubleshoot this networking problem. We just turn the firewall off on this host because there'd be nothing blocking it then, right? 
I'm sure none of you have ever done that. It has some consequences, though. Um, yeah, yeah, I can hear that. that, that uh, ne ne I'm sure you've never heard of that particular problem. But if you have security people in the room with you, um, you know, they're good at this stuff. There's a good way you can look at actually solving this problem in sort of creative ways that don't expose you to massive amounts of risk. Postmortems. In postmortems, we often come away with a lot of action items, um, things that we should do. They all have, often those action items have security consequences. Have conversations with those guys about, in those postmortems, about, um, you know, what, what we should be doing, how we should be doing it, how we should be doing this more efficiently, um, and how we should actually, um, you know, solve the problem in a sort of sane and secure sort of way. Security people actually really like metrics. I don't know many people know this, but security people are very metrics-driven people. You have a whole bunch of metrics and data they actually care about. Um, they probably have a whole bunch of metrics and data you care about. Expose them to your metrics and data. There is nothing like, as I said before about patching, nothing will make a security person happier than not having to go and find an operations person who is ducked behind the building or gone on holiday or hid from them because they want to know the patching status of the system. If you go, here is access to our configuration management database and all our reporting data, you can have just have this query, uh, or here's this report we'll mail you every day that has the status of that. Their bosses are the ones hounding them for that information. If you provide that information to them, that's a really good way, that's a really collaborative and helpful way to get them on side. So, I apologise for talking very quickly. Um, Gene just went way over time. It's shocking. Um, <laughs> Gene's looking at that. Um, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated.